Thank you, Paolo. Thank you, uh, Giovanni, for the invitation. It was very nice to, well, it's nicer to meet you in person, but uh, that's the best we can do right now. So that's what we do. And uh, thanks everyone for being here on a Friday evening. Um, so I will talk about uh, this uh, uh, about this recent work we've, we've, which we've been doing in my group. And um, so the key persons, I mean, this is the photo of the time my group uh, last January, when we still could be out and have parties in uh, without restrictions. But the, so the key person is uh, Niraj, uh, the, the, the person down close to me, and then also Nana and the Banjan were part of the study, uh, but there are more people involved and I will list them uh, later on. All right, before I, I dig into this, so I think I, I'll show you a slide that we usually show to the, um, to, to when we have to explain what, what we do with magnitude is interesting. And the, uh, I think the big uh, question that we have among the many challenges that, that, that there are is the, um, the need for energy for, for data, which is increasing a lot. Uh, one of my students actually found this um, that uh, number, which is pretty interesting, that with 300 Google searches, you uh, consume the same energy as to boil one liter of water, which is pretty uh, pretty amazing as as, as a number. Um, so, and the other thing is that these there are different estimates. There are actually some revision right now, and I think we should uh, you know, we should all make an effort to try to actually give the right numbers, but. It seems that within one decade or two, the, the, uh, the data, data consumption data centers will become unsustainable. The electric cost, the electric energy cost will be too much. So we need to do something, and I think we need to do something which is not incremental, because clearly the incremental work has been done when it comes to magnetic technology. And so this could be an hopeful outcome if the research really goes in some places where it becomes useful. But uh, even with our application, I found in my group pretty uh, amazing uh, what we do. We're using the um, light to control, to understand and control materials. This is a, a funny animation from a, a nice article in Quanta magazine where they call it Alchemy Arrives in a Burst of Light. And uh, this is basically the idea which with the development of lasers, actually, we can control and uh, understand and control materials uh, in a much deeper way than we could do just not long ago. And here is this, of course, Exaggerated example of turning a bun into a unicorn, but um, that's 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 what, what it is. And I know it sounds like you know when you talk femtosecond lasers, like a strong laser, one thing, yeah. But how do you apply this? Well, it, it's the smallest femtosecond laser available right now as this size. So it's the size of a pen. So if you if you think about, um, um, I would say like implementation a workstation. I mean, having a, a femtosecond laser is not an impossible thing, all right? So it's, it's still far-fetched, but this, the development there is so fast that we don't know. All right, so in this talk, let me see. Okay, yes, I will tell you about a bit of our work on this thing and how we use advanced light, or light, uh, unusual light sources to understand, in this case, magnetism better. My group has a lot of work done. It, uh, we, were, we just heard a talk about a synchrotron. We do a lot of work at the free electron lasers. Uh, in particular, now we're active at uh, the European Expand Hamburg. Uh, we also have quite a lot going, going on at Fermi. Hopefully when LCLS comes back in California, then we will also go there. And, uh, but the talk I will um, present today has been uh, is based on measurement that we've been doing at Telbe in, in Dresden, which is a, a, yes, a free electron laser actually is a, so called a super radiant source. But the, the, um, the, the radiation generated is not X-rays, but is terahertz. So frequency range between the microwave, the gigahertz, and the far infrared. Uh, okay, why did we do this? So uh, the starting point uh, is the, I hope the only equations I will show you today, sorry, this, one of the two, is the LLG equation, which uh, in this community most of people know, uh, but I will just briefly go through it in a very, you know, at a very high level uh, for this talk. Uh, the LLG equation, the landau lifshitz gilbert equation, tells you, describes how the magnetization moves under the effect of an external uh, or an effective magnetic field, which is uh, misaligned with respect to the magnetization. So if uh, the M, the, the magnetization of, of your sample and uh, the effective field are misaligned, what this equation tells is that the magnetization will start to process around such an effective field. In absence of damping, this will continue forever. This is the Larmor precession. But when you put damping, then what you would see is that the, uh, the magnetization will tend to align uh, 
uh, with the magnetic field. This is what we do when we want to set the magnetization of our sample. We apply the field and we let LLG, uh, you know, we let the, the, the magnetization fold the LLG equation. And this is like, if you want to do schematic, this, uh, this equation represents how the, um, except as just as I said, the, the precession and spiraling around the new equilibrium position. It also describes, if the field is particularly intense, how you switch uh, the magnetization from, let's say, one equi equilibrium position to the other. So in the hysteresis loop, and this is at the base, such a switching as the, at the base of how the information is encoded in data center. So uh, I gave this presentation and I had a, at a departmental meeting with most of astrophysicists, and I call this, this is the Netflix equation. This is the equation that where big data is, this equation is being used uh, over and over all the time. Uh, but the LLG, formally, I mean, now I try to, don't, don't jump on me uh, yet, but is wrong in the sense that, uh, and this I will give credit to the person who made me notice this, is that the LLG equation, if you um, uh, actually look at it from, a, uh, if you write the Lagrangian, is that it's a completely unphysical inertial tensor. And Gilbert, the G in this equation, noticed it in 2004 in a review where he wrote in a small footnote, actually, I, I read the review, I never looked at the footnote. He said, I was unable to conceive of a physical object with an inertial tensor of this kind. And when we start to work on this, I have to go back to my physics 101 courses that I remember. So the tensor with most zeros, sorry, the object with most zeros uh, uh, that, that I could come up with that you can find also on Wikipedia is the rod that rotates around this axis which has almost all the inertial tensor with zero elements except two. But with all zero except one, uh, apparently not even Gilbert could find one. And so the question is, how can be wrong if it's being used every day in data centers when we, when we do this? And of course, uh, it is wrong, but it is cor very correct in the approximation we use it. So, and if it's so that uh, for what it matters for the, uh, the degrees of freedom that are involved, the energy, so the other, the, the things that, are, that complete the equations are far away in energy, we can ignore them in the relevant time scales. So, uh, and this is basically the point why this is probably not been uh, observed before, because this happens, as we'll see, at time scales which we usually don't look at, that we don't care about in magnetism. Okay, so you can treat the degree of freedom independently, and this is a good approximation for the slow degree of freedom, which is the one of, in this case, of precession, which is the one that. Uh, the uh, LLG nicely describes. Um, so in 2011, uh, uh, Jean-Éric uh, rederived the full equation uh, with the Lagrangian formalism. And he got the same equation, of course, it's not completely wrong, but there is an extra term, which is a second derivative, and it looks like this. And it's very nice, I, if you're interested in this, I strongly recommend to read this, this paper in this American Journal of Physics, which is the, the journal where teachers uh, write on it. It's extremely pedagogical. I was uh, amazed by how uh, nicely this was uh, uh, could be derived and written in a, it's it's a, you know a complex vectorial derivation but it's not uh, anything super complicated so it was it was very it was very nice to see and um, it's surprising that it was not done before but this is this is what it is and when you add this term uh, on top of the precession that I showed before in the LLG what what uh, what you find is that uh, you observe uh, notations. So I'm not uh, familiar with this type of experiment. Sorry? Uh, no, no, it was. Uh, you can... I think you can go okay, ahead. Sorry. Okay. Uh, all right. So basically, what, what this equation tells you is that uh, on top of uh, the, the precession, then basically what you get is what's called this notation, this small weakening, which is actually what you have in any rotating objects. You do the Earth, uh, uh, a spinning top. I found that also a bullet. So everything, when you when you have a proper inertial tensor, something that rotates at this. It has to do with the conservation of angular momentum. So the new parameter that this derivation introduces is this tau, which is, uh, it can be interpreted as the angular momentum relaxation time, which basically show you that, you know, what, what you see already here in this schematic is that you have notation for the first, for, uh, at the, for the first oscillation, but then when you start to rotate, the notation basically fade away. And this basically tau describes how, how much time it takes for these notations to, to fade away. Um, and so if you, how quick can you find it? So if you derive this equation, basically what, what, it, what it shows, this is from, I, for, sorry, I apologize for not having put in the reference. This is from also from a paper from Jean-Éric Vegro. And uh, if you look at the susceptibility as a function of, of frequency, you, you, uh, you solve the equation, you find the usual uh, ferromagnetic resonance peak at lower frequency in the gigahertz regime. And at much higher frequency, uh, you find this what should be the notation peak. 
which is small in amplitude and, as I said, at much higher frequency. And uh, so the, the, the point is that this tau at, the, at this point, so this is just a parameter. So in this paper, it was assumed a certain tau, but the, there has not been yet, well, until the experiment I will show you, a way to measure this. So it can be a bit anywhere. So that was the, uh, the question. This is all, all uh, theoretical. So in 2017, I was at the Ultrafast Managing Conference and uh, Janelle gave a great presentation on, about this. I was really, uh, I think the entire audience was really fascinated by this because it's kind of made, made us rethink, uh, you know, <laughs> about something that we thought we, we, we thought we knew very well. And it was interesting because a coincidence a few years before, uh, I had seen in, in, uh, in some material when I was a postdoc, uh, some oscillations in, the, in a MOOC signal which was 0.3 terahertz. When I was driving the system with the with Tourette's fields, and um, and I couldn't never, I mean, I, I put it in the back of my head, but I never knew what it was. And uh, I was I was remember it was fun. Janine Bigot was there at the time, was overhearing us, and he said, "Yes, you should definitely do Tourette's on this to try to see if you find them." And so then I proposed to Genetic that we try to do this forced uh, oscillator experiment. So we basically do a, a um, uh, the same experiment as, as, uh, as with FMR. So we basically uh, scan the, um, the frequency of, of, our, of our magnetic field, AC magnetic fields, as you do in FMR, to try to find the resonance, just as we do it with terrestrial fields. And the interesting thing, so the evidence that I found something in this uh, range where this new machine, Telbe, was starting operation, so it gave us the idea, okay, let's go and try the Dell, because there we can nicely tune this frequency and go and try to see if uh, there is uh, there is a resonance. Uh, to be honest, I, I didn't put all the reference, but a lot of people tried with the sources that were available then, and uh, and this has been attempted. Of course, it's not uh, the idea is pretty simple. It's just that we we now have a new source and we try to do this. And and so this is the the lab. This is Terrell's lab. So you have electron uh, bunches which are accelerated in a in a magnet. And you can have from 0.1 to 1.2 terahertz. And as they wiggle, so these electron charged particles, they wiggle in the magnets, they produce basically a terahertz field, uh, which has the uh, imprinted the shape of the undulator. So if you if you look at this, so basically the terahertz field that you get out, which is an electric and it has an electric and magnetic component, uh, it looks like this. So it's about 10, 12 cycles of, of terahertz field uh, at a certain frequency. So the width. So the total duration of your path changes, the number of oscillations does not. And so we went to this machine and tried to scan uh, this. And uh, the way we do the, the detection, uh, so we get this uh, terrace beam from the electron, which is down in the basement. It shoots the, the terrace up, which is shown here, the terrace pass that comes up and then you focus it with the proper optics. And all this is synchronized with a 800 nanometer femtosecond laser. So it's a much shorter pulse than the duration of the terrace. And you vary the time of arrival between the pump. Uh, sorry, yes, the, uh, the, sorry, the pump is fixed. You, uh, you vary the time of arrival of the probe laser. And so you can map uh, the, the temporal evolution of, of, of your system. And in, in some uh, uh, detail, so if we zoom in, so we came with a terahertz field like this. So we only plot here the terahertz uh, magnetic field component here, uh, orthogonal to the sample. And at H ter so the beam is orthogonal to the, to the, to the fin plane. And the terahertz is orthogonal to the magnetization. The terahertz magnetic field is orthogonal to M, so that we maximize M cross H. And to show you how this nicely works is that we can nicely control the polarization of the terahertz. If we go at M cross H, uh, we get we see that uh, there is a, a mock signal uh, as a function of time, which is uh, in this case, well, I, I forgot what resonance, what frequency is this? I think it's 0.6 or 0.5 terahertz. Uh, it follows the driving field. If you turn the terahertz parallel, you see nothing. So this was a very nice uh, way to check uh, these selection rules of, of the terahertz. And it, it's the first proof that we are doing an M cross H terahertz uh, measurement. And so the idea then was try to do this uh, uh, forced oscillator experiment. And uh, again, <laughs> if we remember physics 101, uh, the, uh, if you're at the resonance, you have the largest amplitude at the resonance. Uh, so if you switch through the, through the resonance, and then what you can also uh, remember, what you can also do, you, you can you have another information piece of information, uh, which is the phase. Before the resonance, your oscillation and your driving force are in phase, which in each other, they get in quadrature, so 90 degrees at the resonance, and then after the resonance they go uh, out of phase, 180 degrees. 
So that's what we did. So at first, just to show you the, the well, kind of the raw data. So the, the data, uh, I will make a comment, but this is pretty, doing this experiment at this facility is never trivial, but uh, what uh, you see here, and I apologize, I think the, the, the alliance got a bit misaligned, but the, the message is still there. So if you see a 0.4 terahertz, a 0.6 and 0.8, three of the terahertz, uh, the frequency we measure, the amplitude of the response uh, is not constant. So you see it's lower at 0.4 terahertz, slightly higher at 0.6, and then uh, it gets uh, smaller again at 0.8. So there was the first, uh, I mean, and we did this for several samples. So I will show you a summary in the end. So this is the first evidence that there may be some sort of resonance underlying. The beauty of these experiments with the fact that the terahertz, I mean, is a fast excitation, but it's still much uh, lower, uh, slower than the, um, than, the, uh, than the probe that we use, which is a, a femtosecond laser of 50 femtosecond duration, is that we can actually do a phase resolve measurement. So what I show here is the theta care, so it's the care rotation angle. Uh, in this case, uh, well, I, I didn't say it explicitly, we were in polar care rotation. So we're measuring the excursion or the magnetization out of the thin plane uh, as a function of time. And here I put only two cases because it was, uh, it became very crowded with this, uh, with this, with this plot, but you all, all the data is in the supplemental material of the, of the paper. And what you see here, so the green noise, a bit more noisier data, is the, um, uh, is the experimental data, so the, the MOC signal. Uh, the, the, um, the pink is a simulation that we did. And in both cases, so let's say put in both the simulation and the experiment, the input was the uh, driving force, so the magnetic field uh, of the, uh, that we send with the, uh, from Telbe. And this we can characterize independently. So before we do this measurement, we go and characterize exactly the amplitude and phase of the, of the magnetic field, which is the gray line here. And what this data show is that when you're at 0.4 terahertz, there is maybe a small phase shift, but let's say uh, the, the, uh, the, uh, the oscillation of the driving force and the, uh, um, and the um, uh, experiment are basically in phase. At 0.6 terahertz, there is a much uh, uh, larger phase shift, which is basically very close to 90 degrees within the noise of the measurement. And uh, as again, I didn't show it here, but if you go and look at the supplemental material of the paper, we show that it, it goes out of phase when you go up in frequency again. So that was very encouraging. And I mean, this is starts to get a pretty uh, strong uh, uh, evidence that something is going on there. And quite interesting uh, is that we, we, this data improved quite a lot since we put the paper on archive. As if we do the FFT, you actually get the, normal, the amplitude uh, quite well, uh, normalized quite well. The, um, uh, so the, we had three samples. We had a cobalt iron boron, and then we had the two nickel iron films of different crystalline quality. Uh, the idea was to try to see if the crystalline quality had any uh, effect on the uh, on the notations, because we thought it could have, it, it doesn't seem it has, maybe something. So I, I forgot to write it, but the middle nickel iron is polycrystalline, the one at the bottom is crystalline. And if you see, it's maybe slightly, um, the, the line width is slightly uh, smaller for the, for the crystalline one in the bottom. Uh, but what you can see is that the, um, there is indeed a frequency, so there is a peak that we can simulate, although, albeit the, the width doesn't match quite uh, too well the simulations. We, 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 have a, we tried a few things to add in temperature, add in micromagnetics, we cannot really match it. And this is an open question, but quite nicely. So for the two, for the two nickel uh, permalloy, we get basically a frequency of about 0.6 terahertz, and then uh, it's about 0.5 or something for the cobalt iron boron. So at least there is, seems to be uh, a material dependent um, uh, effect on this. And uh, I can tell you, we have now looked at this in the lab. I will mention it again, at yet different materials, and we do see a remarkably different uh, notation frequencies now. And it's interesting because this is, this resonance is 100 times, 1,000 times, any no resonance in this, um, in this material. So the, the best explanation we could put with a simulation where we add this inertial term is that this indeed, uh, the evidence for indeed the notation dynamics or inertial spin dynamics in ferromagnets. And this was a very tough experiment. So um, each point that you see here took six hours to, to record. And we did this measurement three times over one year, because of course the time first we saw a peak, we say, okay, well, maybe it's the machine, we don't know. 
Uh, it's not, the machine is actually incredibly stable. It's a very nice, uh, uh, they worked a lot in actually doing the photon diagnostics to be extremely working well. And we of course did, we, every time we sample the frequency in different ways, so we avoided drift and we try to do things systematic, almost as particle physicists. And um, it's, so it's very robust. So after three times we went there, we always get the same results. So we kind of felt confident we can put this out. And it's also very heavy data uh, processing for this, uh, but it allows, that's what I was saying, that the photon diagnostic, basically each terahertz pulse which is sent is corrected in amplitude and phase. So we know exactly with 10 femtosecond precision when the terahertz is coming. This is a marvel. Uh, it's actually something that, uh, <laughs> It's, it's amazing how they managed to be able to do it so quickly uh, at Telby because it's, uh, um, it automatically gives you the data which is corrected in time. This is not the case again at all, uh, at all such large amplitude machines. So it's, even though the data is big, we could get it analyzed pretty quickly right away. So some more details now I'm, I'm going to the conclusion, uh, uh, you know, not, not rushing, but I'm, I'm close to, to them. So the angular momentum relaxation time that you get out of these measurements is over the order of 10 picoseconds, which this confirms, I mean, those explains why this is not really relevant for the switching at the hundreds of nanosecond uh, time scales. This is something that happens really only at the ultra fast time scale. And so it's not important for the slow switching. The, um, the other questions that if you're interested this, I will not go through in, uh, this in this talk, but where does inertia come from, from a microscopical point of view? And this was derived by Petr Oppener in Uppsala and others, I think, I mean, he's not the only one, but I think he wrote, uh, I hope I'm not saying mistake, but they think he derived a full Hamiltonian where in, when you include higher order spin orbit coupling terms, then you basically get this uh, inertial terms out of a, you know, a microscopic thing. So a single spin, I mean, the one we, we study quantum mechanics with two level system, you will not have notations. So when the spin orbit somehow, that's the way I, I probably is the wrong language, but the way I try to see that the spin orbit somehow gave the mass to this, um, to this, to this, to this, to this, to the spin, to the magnetization. And we see now notation in, in the table uh, with tabletop uh, source in the lab. So we, uh, so we actually went, I mean, now we have a, we have a broadband source in the lab. If the sample is large enough, uh, um, I say, the, the, this is particularly evident that we can also see there. We're almost there, the quality of the, of the terrace beam that Telbe has. Uh, we do a broad clamp and then we filter. And um, the interesting thing, this is something that I can leave you uh, with a curiosity. The uh, ratio of the magnetic notation precession frequencies is the same as the uh, precession and, sorry, the notation and precession ratio in the earth, which is about a thousand times or magnitude, maybe a hundred times. It's an interesting coincidence for the other Gilbert, the, the one that, uh, who wrote in, um, in 1600, exactly 1600, the De Magnete, he thought that all the planets were being kept together by magnetic forces, not by gravitation. This was before Newton. And if he would have known that even this is, co I mean, there is this coincidence in, in the, between the, the Earth and the magnetism, uh, that, that there is this ratio between precession and notation, which I think would be a very anecdotal argument for trying to uh, push his way. It's not, it's not the, the case, of course, but I found it was interesting to, to, to mention this. Uh, okay, so when does it matter? Just that we, I will conclude a bit more on concrete. So I think one of the best uh, uh, view graphs and explanation of this, I think, was made by Ke uh, Alexei Kimmel, uh, where they saw actually the inertia in uh, the inertia during spin switching in antiferromagnets. So what what we saw here is the first time we saw it in a ferromagnet. So when there is a net M. Uh, what he, he put in is a very nice uh, schematic. If you have no inertia and you have to cross a potential barrier, in this case, the one for switch from zero to one, from north to south pole, uh, your stimulus without inertia has to be as long as, as the time as you, it takes for, to bring you the, the object, uh, the ball, if you want, from the uh, bottom to the, to the top of the, to the maximum of the well, and then let it fall down. You could think this could be the way you have to make a feather switch, something very light. You have to bring it all the way up and then it can fall down by itself but it will not uh, do anything. If you have inertia, you could imagine that a kick, like a, a ultra fast stimulus could actually help to do this because basically the mass will, will, will do the work for you. You don't need to carry it all the way up. So this is, I think, is something that if, 
uh, in, in some years, or we want to understand the, uh, the switching of uh, ultra fast timescales in magnitude. This could be a relevant mechanism. It could be some, some one of the ingredients that may help understanding the still open question of, of uh, how do we dissipate angular momentum at ultra fast timescales, which is, has been a, an open question for the last 20 years in, in the community. All right, so this was, um, it took a while, but uh, I think in the end we managed to get a nice, a nice paper out. And I think uh, we have to thank the referee of the, the work because it actually helped us improve the, the work a lot. And uh, we also got, uh, hold of uh, someone very good in doing uh, animations or like better like imaging and so which who tried to represent this in um, in, a, in a schematic and fancy fashion and this is all the co-authors that I, I need, I'm deeply grateful to not only Niraj who did the, a lot of the work for the analysis and was there but this is really a team effort this is these experiments it's almost like doing a, a atlas or like a CERN experiment it was four from us from Stockholm and Venice for experiment analysis, but there were eight people there at Talbot running the facility and they all were needed because we, you get 24 hour shifts. You need to do a lot of things uh, to get things right. And then we need the samples to be nicely grown and characterized. And then we also have theory support. So it's in the end, we ended up being like 20 co-authors, but uh, I think all deserve to be there. And, uh, and it was a great team effort. All right, uh, and I think this is my last slide. Yes, so I'll thank you for uh, being here listening on a Friday afternoon and I'm happy to take your questions. Thanks.